All right, well, we've come to one of our favorite types of episodes here at Muscle Car of the Week, and that's where we stop down to take a couple minutes to answer some of the comments that we get either on our online channels or through emails. And uh, we've gotten a lot of great feedback from some really great viewers, people that uh, watch every episode, and it's always cool to get that feedback uh, because sometimes we make mistakes or sometimes people have great insights about things that we showed on Muscle Car of the Week. So we'll dive right in and uh, talk about a recent episode, episode 204, we showed a bright yellow 1970 Yanko Deuce Nova. And we got a lot of positive feedback on that car. A lot of people really liked it. Uh, but a gentleman named Brian Cabral actually pointed out something that I thought was kind of interesting and worth discussing. And essentially what he said is that Yanko sold uh, a car that was a pretty potent performer, but by no means was that the hottest Nova you could buy. And in reality, if an individual bought a small block Nova back in 1970, they could throw a few of their own performance parts at it. They could go to their local speed shop and buy an intake manifold and camshaft and gears and tires and all that kind of stuff. And without spending a whole bunch of money, they could have built their own version of a high performance Nova that would have been on par with the Yanko Deuce, which is absolutely true to start with. It's also true for most muscle cars. These cars all responded to a lot of the same modifications to make them go faster. But another way to look at it, and, and our standpoint was, of those yellow Yanko Deuce Novas, there was only 10 built. And to see one today is something special. Uh, sure, there were other cars that performed better, uh, but one of the neat things about Muscle Car of the Week and the Cars in the Brothers collection is that these are, for the most part, all very authentic cars, survivors, or they've been restored, but they're kind of the real deal. So we're not here to show you uh, what we claim to be as the ultimate performing cars, uh, just historically significant ones that are kind of a treat to check out. But it's a great point that other people who might not have necessarily bought a Yanko Deuce Nova certainly put together some very potent Novas of their own to go prowl the streets back in 1970. Going to another recent episode, uh, episode number 203, the 1968 Plymouth GTX 426 Hemi car. I kind of mischaracterized that car in my delivery discussing uh, what that car is all about. And I, I kind of called it a gussied up Roadrunner uh, while describing the GTX package. And that's technically not true. The GTX was a very separate car, different from the Roadrunner. Where I was going is when you look at the literature that, that Chrysler Corporation uh, used to describe their cars, they roped the Roadrunner and the GTX and the Satellite uh, and the Belvedere all in the same category being the mid-size cars. So where I was going is it's a mid-size car on the same platform because a lot of the parts underneath exchange from the Roadrunner and the GTX uh, where those cars become different is as you look at the outside trim levels and the styling of the body panels. So although they technically have the same DNA with the mid-size platform, it is true that they are different cars, and I probably should have articulated that better in that episode. Going back in time to episode 96 with the 1969 Plymouth Barracuda mod top car, a very interesting yellow car with the crazy vinyl top pattern that was uh, available from the factory. When we showed that car, we lifted the hood and pointed out that it had a 318 with a four barrel, and a sharp viewer noticed that uh, that really wasn't an option back then. They came with two barrels. Well, this car has the original two barrel intake manifold and carburetor still with it, but when it was purchased and brought into the Brothers collection, uh, the four barrel was installed and the two barrel was in the trunk. So the original manifold is still with the car, a very sharp eye for catching that one. On episode 87, we showed a 289 K-Code 1966 Ford Mustang. Very cool orange car, and we showed a shot of the exhaust tips, and we had a viewer comment on YouTube saying, hey, those have louvers in the exhaust tips. What's the deal? Well, those are, uh, they call them trumpet louvers. It's uh, an exhaust tip that was on that car from the factory, and I don't think it had any performance enhancement. 
uh, because anytime you block off exhaust, it doesn't really enhance performance. So it was a styling cue of that car. Uh, most people claim that they don't make them sound any better. In fact, some say they make them sound much worse. And for performance reasons, most of those louvered trumpet tips got removed many, many years ago. Uh, but somebody asked, so we thought we'd take a sec to, uh, to touch on the trumpet louvers on the 66 K code. In episode number 72, we featured a black 1970 Dodge Challenger TA car. It's a very, very cool car. Uh, the TA package referred to Trans Am Racing. Uh, and somebody had written in saying, hey, I, I understand the, the TA, but there was a lower line Challenger known as the SE. What does the SE stand for? Uh, and as far as we can tell and what's generally accepted is the SE stands for Special Edition. So little sidebar trivia on that Challenger TA car. In episode 202, uh, we showed you a very cool 15,000 mile, one of 17, 1971 Pontiac GTO Judge convertibles. And that car is what I would call the definition of a survivor. It's got all original equipment on the car, the engine, driveline, all that stuff is the way it was when it came uh, new in 1971 including some of the flaws that it wears today. And that's kind of what makes it a survivor. It wasn't restored, it's uh, mostly an original car. Now I, I can't say for certain that it didn't have some paint work over the years or it might have been touched up or, or whatnot, but several viewers pointed out that the nose cone fits a little bit loose and there might have been a little bit of uh, paint removed or, or even rust on the bottom of the rocker panels and under the hood isn't detailed like a show car. And that was left intentionally, you know, because the old saying is they're only original once. And this car stands as a great example of, of how it was. Uh, will it be restored someday? I don't know, only the future will tell. But only having 15,000 and change on the odometer shows that this car doesn't necessarily need a mechanical restoration because everything seems to work just fine. Uh, but it's interesting to see how it looks, even with a couple blemishes. And I still think it's an awesome, awesome car. We recently did an episode featuring the fastest cars of 1970 as reported by a variety of different magazines back in the day. And this was episode number 201. And we got a lot of feedback on this one. Many people really enjoyed the fact uh, that we were able to show uh, a pretty accurate representation of the cars from back in the day uh, that just happened to be in the Brothers collection. And other people had a lot to say about cars that might have been a lot faster or a different order of top tens. And our mission for that episode was to go back into the archives and find magazine articles that reported how these cars ran back in 1969 and 1970. Not necessarily trying to say that these are definitively the fastest cars. I mean, you have to understand, the variables involved were the person driving, the weather conditions on that particular day, the equipment they used to measure the speeds back in that day. So it might not be the most accurate uh, as far as what these cars truly did, but it's what was reported and those stories have stood the test of time. Would we like to take these cars out on the track and find out for ourselves? Absolutely. Is that going to happen anytime soon? I don't think so, but we'll try. And finally, uh, we have a request from uh, a loyal viewer named Striper Vince, who says, hey, you always invite us to your website at musclecaroftheweek.com to see more of the cars, but when will you invite us to see them in person? And we have a little bit of news on that front. Uh, maybe we can give you a little bit of a teaser. The The Brothers Collection is in the process of assembling a public space, kind of a museum, where they're going to have their cars on display. And we were actually able to get in there and see a little bit of what goes on behind closed doors as they build the museum. They don't have all the cars in there yet. They do have a tremendous collection of neon signs uh, of the various makes of the cars in the collection. And we did get to enjoy a little bit of an attraction uh, which is not necessarily going to be in place when the museum is open to the public, uh, but we were able to take a car and make a little bit of tire smoke inside uh, as kind of a last hurrah before they start moving stuff in. 
you want to make sure you like our Facebook page and you subscribe to our YouTube channel and join our email list on our website because we will be making announcements as to the progress of the public opening of the Brothers Collection Museum to where you can see them hopefully in public for yourself. Until then, you've got to keep watching Muscle Car of the Week for more cool cars and we'll see you next time and as always, we welcome your comments.